Welcome to episode 29 of Woo Woo for the Skeptic. I'm Kim Polander, your host and curiosity advocate for the world of metaphysics. My love of all things four-legged has seeped into this week's show, which is highlighting animal communication. Animals are our best friends and confidants, but are they here to teach us more than just companionship? A piece of our higher selves are actually seeded into our pets, which gives us a greater connection to what our soul is trying to learn and messages it's trying to give us. Given the opportunity, animals have great wisdom to share with us, help us through our blocks, and provide a foundation of unconditional love to facilitate our soul's growth and healing. I know you already talk to your pet, but have you ever been curious as to what they're saying back to you? I'm so excited that my guest today is animal communicator Brigitte Noel. As a child who moved from country to country with her parents, Brigitte always had a deep connection with animals. After an unfulfilling career in real estate, Brigitte explored her special connection with pets in a more focused way and eventually developed her own telepathic technique of communicating with animals. Brigitte now offers individual consulting with a compassionate, knowledgeable, and sensitive approach that includes both the animal perspective and the human perspective. Brigitte, thank you so much for being on the show and welcome. Thank you. Hello. So why don't you first tell the listener just how it was that you took an interest in animal communication specifically? Well, it happened, you know, like all things, it happens over a period of time. I've always been fascinated and very drawn to animals. And I always thought it would be something quite extraordinary if we could break through the barrier of language and connect with them without having to use words because words are obviously the wall that kept that keeps us from or kept us from finding out more of what's going on in their minds and for a long time i just thought that this was not possible and i didn't quite know how to go about it i just had it kind of like a thought in the back of my mind and then i started to do work with a metaphysical group, I got really involved in metaphysics and self-awareness. And I found out that there was a woman who actually did animal communication and that you could have a nonverbal exchange. And that was absolutely fascinating. And this person was Samantha Curry. She uh, worked out of, um, I think it was... Um, somewhere up near the LA area. And she came down here and I was quite excited about it. And I had a cat and a horse at the time. And I thought, well, I will have her come down to the ranch where I boarded my horse. And I will try to convince the seven or six people she needed to make the trip down there to do this with me. And so I did, and she came down. And I watched her as she went from horse to horse and connected with them and jotted things down on a pad and talked to people. And I talked to the owner and I knew the horses. So I knew that what she was getting was correct because I had kind of, I knew the person, I knew the horse and I went, oh, this is amazing. Then I brought my cat to her. She came down again. She would come periodically down to the San Diego area. And again, I had an experience with her and I thought this is great. And I started to explore it a little bit more. And at the time, that was, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago now. At the time, there were very few people doing this, and there were very few books out on it. So I read what I could and what I could find. And I started to try to do this myself. And I found that it, for me, it was a little bit different than what these other people would explain they you know there was always an idea that animals project images and it's all in that type of form and you would describe a picture that you would receive in your mind's eye well that's not quite how it worked for me however i had done so much intuitive training and psychic training and different things with my metaphysical background that i knew that i could do this it was simply not the way I was wired in my mind, I wasn't wired quite to receive the information the way this other part or these other people were. 
So I didn't get discouraged. I started to look for different ways. And I read a very venerable book called A Kinship with All Life by, I think his name, his last name is Boone. I forget, right now I'm just blanking out on the first name. And he had extraordinary experience with a German shepherd named Strongheart. And he was a movie uh, he was he worked in the in the um, movie business in in the LA area, and he got this dog that was beautifully military trained, and they wanted to use him in the movies as well. And he had to take care of this dog, and all of a sudden he found himself starting to communicate with this dog, who was supremely intelligent. And it was all thought forms, thought patterns. There were no m images involved. And when I discovered that, I went, oh, my God, it's not about images. It's just kind of really getting thought forms in your mind's eye. And it's truly a nonverbal communication that kind of flows. That was my starting point. And after that, things started to really fall into place for me because that's how I was wired. Then I worked you know, as an amateur, I would just go around and ask animals how they were doing, what was going on. And then I would often chat with the uh, person attached to that animal. And people love to talk about their animals so that I would verify the information that I got that was indeed correct. And one thing led to another. And um, this was in the early 90s by that point, And we had a terrible recession in the San Diego area. So my work in real estate just went by the wayside in very few months. And then I became ill. I got Graves' disease in a very serious form, which is a disease of the thyroid gland. And it really hits your metabolism hard. Anyway, and I was in more of a holistic frame of mind. And I really tried to uh, work with holistic healing methods, but it was, they didn't quite know at that time a lot what was Graves' disease. So I had another adventure there where not only I was kind of working with the animals, but I was always also working on healing myself. And then I had to kind of, when I got a little bit better, I had to kind of figure out how to make a living or at least start something new. I didn't really want to do real estate. And the uh, recession was actually a had a silver lining. It meant that there weren't any other jobs, so I might as well start doing this. So that's what I did. And I started, I printed a card and I went out there and I started my animal communication consulting. Wow. That sounds like a great story. Yeah. Just a nice, such a nice progression. Yeah. It's one of those things. Um, I also kind of got a green light from the powers that be in that I had only been, you know, doing this professionally for a few hardly a hardly a week I went out and I started to hand out cards to different places that I thought might be interested and I hit a place here in San Diego that was a cutting edge new doggy wash type of thing it was one of the first thing ones where you could go in and wash your dog and it was set up and it was kind of cutting edge and they had FX TV from New York doing their morning show wanting to do different segments and they had filled up the segments, except for a few, and they wanted to do something a little different. So they had me come in to do animal communication. So I was on direct with New York National TV, and I it was quite an adventure. And to me, it was, you know, the green light. Yeah, this is okay. Go for it. It was an amazing experience. So it's been now 22 years, and it's been a truly quite an amazing, fabulous journey. Yeah, sounds like it. And I like how you were um, explaining that about the pictures, because I had heard that, that, oh, you have to communicate in pictures with animals. And something about that didn't really gel with me, because like with my senses, clairvoyance and pictures, visuals haven't really been the strongest. So it's always been thoughts for me, like thoughts and feelings. So, um, yeah. And it's perfect because that, you know, and so in my workshops, which I, I, I haven't done in a while, I've just done one last year and I had to stop doing them. And now I'm just kind of on a hiatus with workshops. Uh, other things are coming through for me. But in my workshops, I truly teach that. And I try to find out how each individual person receives this communication. And you can receive it, of course, in pictorial form. You can get feelings, sensations in your body. You're really kinetic. 
You can get straight thought forms. So you really get the thought just pops in your mind in a stream. And with that thought comes feelings and emotions. So you can read the thought and qualify it, describe it. And it comes in different ways. And everybody is a bit of this or a bit of that. So it's very important to know how you are best. It's best to know how you receive, how you are set up in your, I guess, in your mind and in your body to receive this information. Because once you know how to do that, you have the conduit. The conduit is there. So if you're more of a thought form person like I am, and somebody is telling you, yes, you are supposed to be finding a lot of pictorial or iconic things in relationship to the communication and nothing is happening, which is what happened to me in the beginning, right? Then you're at a loss. You're saying, I can't do this. When I can tell you that in my workshops, I have managed to help people do it successfully up to maybe, I don't know, 90% of the people. Maybe there are a few that are left that are truly left-brained and very not really comfortable with their more intuitive side. And so they have the most problems. But once you explain to people how to just kind of let go and let things happen and you describe to them how it can happen so they can identify it, then they know that it's really happening. And it takes place. Now, the communication itself is not that difficult to achieve. What's more difficult, and that's what separates the professional from the non-professional, is there's quite a lot of things that are communicated a certain way that are not the way a human anal- you know, analytical person might speak or talk. So you have to be able to interpret. That's why an animal communicator, above all, I believe, is an interpreter. And you have to be the best possible interpreter you can be. You have to be really clear, and you have to keep yourself out of it. But really draw on all your experience with, you know, your experience with the animals. You have to draw on your experience with people as well. And you have to be able to uh, tap into the information that's really coming from your higher self and your intuitive side. So when you're doing a communication, you have a lot of things going on all at the same time. And You make it look effortless, but in fact, you are receiving a lot of information, perceiving a lot of information, and then boiling it down to be able to relate it back to the person in front of you, you know, for them. You're the translator, and you're translating all that to make it simple, clear, understandable, and most importantly, non-threatening. If there is something a little bit difficult going on, you would communicate that in the most Uh, non-threatening and loving way possible without editing anything. Right. Yeah. So now can we talk a little bit about why a listener would want to dive deeper into actually, you know, communicating with their animals? Because I think a lot of people have this perception that, oh, they're just animals. They don't have a lot of deep thoughts other than what kind of food they like to eat or what treats they like. So what are your experiences in the importance or the role of animals in our lives? Their role is huge they teach us so many things. And often they are a buffer. Through our animals, humans learn a lot about their own human mortality. Humans can learn how to be parents. Humans can learn about healing and sickness. I mean, a lot of times things happen to animals before they happen to us, and we can learn from them. When we have For example, animal companions, they are incredibly important in our lives. And some people will just find them, you know, adorable, just nice to have around. Then you have others who are more interested and in what's going on in their animals' minds and emotions. And it also depends what kind of awareness the person has. But the animal also can vary in awareness. You have animals that are pretty basic, meat and potatoes, and then you have animals that are a lot more aware. We are all on a big evolutionary path, whether we're animal or person. And so animals, too, have their learning curve about living on the earth plane. The same, we have learning curve living on the earth plane and interacting with other humans and learning how to come from our heart. Now, the animals, most of the time, they come from their hearts. They don't have 
the same kind of lessons we have, but they totally have a sense of expanding their experiences and who they are. So they learn a lot through their relationship with us. So there is a difference between a wild animal and a domesticated animal. And there's a difference between a domesticated animal and an animal that is an animal companion. And all this is focused on what the animal wants to do and how they want to learn it. And so some may just want to learn how to be wild animals and live in a environment where they're surviving and breeding and thriving, hopefully, and interacting that way. Others want to come and live with us, and they do so in varying degrees. So you have some that are in a zoo, so they're surrounded by people, and they're taken care of by people, but they don't necessarily have a lot of one-on-one Unless, I don't know, you have a zookeeper that has a really strong relationship with an ape or maybe a specific animal. But they are with people, surrounded by people, taken care of by people, but they're not living in a home with a person. Then you have the animal that wants to get closer to us and that decides that they are going to be a pet or a companion animal. And then the learning curve gets even you know, uh, more difficult because living with humans is not an easy thing. We have a lot of emotions that are tied to our mental mind and we go in all kinds of different directions and our mental mind engages in all kinds of possible scenarios that never come to be. So when an animal is tapping into us and they're, you know, finding out that we are worried about this and they don't understand it's an abstract worry, they think it's an immediate worry. And so it can be very confusing. So it takes a lot, quite a while and several incarnations for an animal to uh, really learn how to comfortably be with a human and know what is important and needs to be concerned about and what they can just ignore. Okay, so let's say you have humans that watch the news and the news can be pretty negative. So the humans watching the news can have all kinds of emotions going on through their, through them, you know, in response to whatever is being shown. And let's say that there's a lot of economic worry, right? And that things are not going well. And the news kind of stresses that, well, people can get all kinds of worried. They can become fearful, they can have all kinds of, well, emotions tied to that, negative emotions. And here you have an animal that's next to them. They're having to feel this person go through this whole gamut of emotions. And they have to try to distinguish between, is this real fear? Is this a really serious threat to me? Do we need to run away? Do we? They don't quite understand. And that can be stressful. So they little by little learn what to pay attention to and what to ignore. All right. But that takes a while. We also can have all kinds of conflicting situations for an animal. And that's another thing I work on in my work where we have a divorce. For example, dogs have a very hard time with divorce because In their mind, divorce just does not compute. They are built, wired to love unconditionally forever. They don't understand separation. They don't understand two people not getting along. And they don't understand the breakup. And they they really have a hard time with being expected to divide their loyalties. You know how some people go, well... I want the dog to go with me and the other person say, I want them to go with that. And they come to me and they go, well, we want him to choose. (laughs) That's one of the ways of resolving it. And that poor dog just can't choose because being choosing one is being disloyal to the other. And they have an equal love for each of those individuals. So we kind of sort it out explaining to the dog what's going on and that everybody loves everybody but they just need to live separately and then you know we work out something cats also have a hard time but they have an easier time picking out which is going to be the better environment for them 
So they too don't really like the divorce idea, but they're more self directed. And I don't mean by, I, I really avoided using the word self-centered because I don't, I think it has a negative connotation. I, I, I really try to stay away from the subjective connotations. They're more self, they're very self-aware and they're more self-directed. So they're, they go, you know, they come first. It's a very healthy, I come first. And so they're going to look, okay, this is what's happening to my environment. Okay, this person has a house and it's a bigger house and this one's moving here and it doesn't have a yard and I like the house and I do that. I want to go with them. <laughs> they, they pick the one that is going to be better suited to them unless they have a really, really strong connection with the other person. Okay, because you have animals that have incredibly tight bonds with different individuals. Do you notice that certain animals have, is it fair to say that animals as a breed are not more advanced or a species are not more advanced, but like I've noticed my cat can see, you know, my guides, angels, just all all kinds of non-physical things. And then my dog is more of a sensing sort of thing versus a visual. Exactly. Your cat is what we would call in metaphysics a fifth dimensional kind of creature. And the dog is a fourth dimensional creature. One is... They're both whole, but one is really focused on the dog is teaching us unconditional love so that we can learn love. I mean, maybe it's not unconditional, but at least we can learn the purity of love through them. And I found that dogs, and that's what I've learned, what unconditional love is, because I've learned so much from the animals, truly. Uh, they've been my encyclopedia, that a dog will see every shortcoming we have and they will know that perhaps that particular person who has them at this time is not the greatest individual or they may fall short of taking good care of them or really being dedicated to them committed to them but they'll never show it they will still love that person in spite of everything but it doesn't mean that they ignore that other person's downsides. So it's not in unconditional love from what I've learned from the animals. It's not being a bliss ninny. It's on the contrary, have, having being very clear, seeing very clearly, and being able to still love. And that is a huge, amazing lesson that dog push us to. Then when you get into the fifth dimensional aspect, which is what cats are, you develop a really healthy love of others, but also a healthy self-love. You will experience things in a sense of complete unity, which is the fifth dimension, but you will also be aware of the issues and the problems and know how to navigate those waters without compromising yourself. And that's what your cat does. And they are tuned in because they're not here really to serve us or please us or do anything. They are also wired or tuned in to hire a different kind of frequency. They don't have the burden of pulling humans to a better place, you know? They just live their lives and we appreciate them and perceive them we appreciate it, perceive them, and love them. But a person who doesn't perceive that other side of the cat doesn't quite care for them as much. Do you know what I mean? Because it's, there's an invisible part they can't quite figure out. I always call dogs big block capital letters. You know, they're really clear to read. They're most of them. And then kitties, I call them, they, they write in script. And people who like animals that are more clear, more outgoing, who will validate their love all the time, who are real more outgoing companions will, will gravitate to dogs. And people who like a little bit more independence and don't mind that an animal has their own agenda and appreciate that other kind of invisible intuitive side that the cat brings will really like cats. And a lot of people like both. 
Do you know any, um, do you have any perspectives on like contracts with the animals or how? Yes, we do. So there, there are quite a few experiences that people have where you may have a special bond with an animal. And that's happened to me. And I know it's happened to many of my clients where we adore animals, period. But there are certain ones that elicit in us a different connection a different kind of bond. And we know those when they're no longer with us because once these animals are gone, then we realize, oh my God, that bond was so lofty, so amazing. And it's not a bond that you can necessarily replicate with another, even though you love the other to bits. It will be a different bond. And some animals come to us as our familiars. Maybe you, you, you know the term which is animals that have obviously a connection with us from the other side and that reincarnate often with us. And they are familiar. They are part of our, they have a soul bond with us on top of the heart bond. And they help us along our path. You have other animals that just develop an extraordinary bond with you in this lifetime and they may decide that they will come back again in the future with you in different incarnations. So you can even strike that bond down here in the here and now. And then it comes, you know, you can start it at any time in your life. Or you can have animals that you've had a contract or a bond with before and on the other side. Okay. And then let's talk a little bit about like some of the reasons people contact you. Now, I'm sure one of them is behavior patterns. So what have you found as to the, like, just various examples of what is behind a dog's behavior pattern, like um, house training issues or something like that? Okay. So I really focus on the emotions. And I used to call myself the doctor of emotions because what I discovered is animals have a huge emotional capacity and a lot of their problems come from being emotionally distressed and so if you address what is going on and keep that in mind and ask them how they feel about something or what is going on and realizing they have an emotional reaction to quite a few things that goes beyond fear and flight, okay, that goes beyond the basic survival instincts, then you can start finding out a little bit more. And that's what I've done. So let's say you have a lot of times people come and there is something that's going on. And it's usually not something that a, that, uh, you know, the traditional trainer or vet or um, I don't know, the person that that they would turn to can solve. So I found the best source to find out what is going on is the animal. They know we can sit there and speculate from noon to dusk and still not quite get exactly what is going on. So I usually ask them, what is the source of the discomfort? What is going on? What's happening? And uh, they usually have a very clear answer. And if they don't have a clear answer right off the bat, I ask quite a few insightful questions and then we start to get to the root of the problem. And for example, if you have a dog, let's say they, they come in and they have training issues and they are not behaving quite like another dog, dogs normally do. And there's a whole, you know, there's distress. The person doesn't quite know what to do. The, the, they have tried different training things and those have fallen short. The dog doesn't have a really long attention span and it's just a problem. And so I sit down and I find out that this dog is what I call in my work a first timer. That means he's a first-time dog. He's never been a dog before. So everything is overwhelming. And most people expect a dog to act a dog because they like a dog because they think, well, it's instinct. They just know how to be a dog. Well, that's not always the case. They have to learn everything from scratch. They have to learn how to be a dog, how to interact with other dogs. They have to learn 
how to be with a person, how to remember how I was talking about identifying people, emotions and what people want and things like that. That is all new to them. So what we do in that case, when I figured out that this animal is a first timer, now they can be a first timer off of other lives. So it doesn't mean these animals that are first timers are often very intelligent. They just don't know how to be a dog very well. So they're learning everything from scratch in this lifetime. And they could have been another animal before. Let's say that they were a rabbit before. Rabbit is a fear and flight animal. And it's a prey animal. Then this animal all of a sudden decides, well, I'm going to be a dog. They come in and they're a dog. But a dog is a predator. And it's not a fear and flight animal. And so all of a sudden, all the information that this dog has in his little suitcase, you know, of how to behave is not really dog-like. It's very fear and flight. It's very prey-like. And the sounds they hear are different. Everything is different. So what happens is I just tell people when that happens, slow everything down, lower your expectations, really teach them everything and don't expect them to know anything. And what shifts is all of a sudden people go, oh my God, yes, indeed. And whether they really believe what I'm explaining to them or they accept it or they truly understand it, just the fact that they are slowing down, that they've lowered their expectations, they're not wanting that dog to accomplish everything like a normal dog or like their prior dog who did everything, you know, standing on his head. It totally helps them quiet down. The people's emotions shift to a lot of compassion and empathy. The dog doesn't feel as pressured and can slow down and start to register the learning. And since those dogs often need a lot of repetition, it doesn't matter. I said, if you have to repeat it 10 times, who cares? The whole point is that they get it in the end. And keep all your expectations really low. And after a few years, the dogs tend to really start to come together and get it. And they move forward much faster and they make a lot of progress. So is that a general guideline for any behavior pattern? Like, let's say, aggression towards other dogs or like... No, no. Then you have all the others. I was giving you this one because it's, it's, a, it's one that people are often not aware of. They completely ignore that that's a possibility that a, a dog doesn't know how to be a dog, you know? that they're learning how to be a dog. But no, you have all kinds of, you know, you have aggression or you have dogs, for example, there was a dog that didn't want to get into a person's van anymore. The dog was a, not a service dog, but a therapy dog. And so he brings me the dog because the dog is lying down, not wanting to get in the van. And before that, the dog really loved doing the service work and this and that. And it's just not happening as smoothly. And so we wanted to find out what it was. Well, I find out the dog is just plain tired, not really wanting to admit that he's not really wanting to do this anymore because he doesn't want his person's hurt his person's feelings. But I find out that that person is going four or five times a week to do therapy work which is huge. That's a huge amount. So the person has retired, has obviously converted their, you know, their work day into going to do good, good works with their therapy dog. But it's way draining on the dog. And this has been going on for two, two years or more. And so we have to find a better schedule for that dog, slow down the visits to maybe once or twice a week. And find where the dog likes to go the most and do that for a while. And then I said, you need to find another dog. If you want to do this much therapy work, you need to find a dog to back this one up. You can't just do it all with this dog. But this dog was really caught between a rock and a hard spot because dogs want to please us, right? So he had, it was a she actually, she had taken it as far as she could go. And then she would be very, it would can be very confusing to him because, because she wanted to please him. She was giving mixed messages. She would not really want to get in the van, but then if he coaxed her enough, then she would. Right. So then she would, once she would get to the place, then she would, you know, go do her work. But emotionally she was drained because what happens, and I explained that is 
every time you take your dog, and I'd like your listeners to know this too because it's important for the dogs, any time you take your therapy dog to a nursing home or to see children or to, I don't know, wounded warriors, whatever, this dog comes in and brings all their love, brings in all their wonderful energy, and pours it into each one of these people. Those people usually are sad or can be depressed or can have problems. And so their cup is empty. So their cup gets filled with the energy that the animal brings. But each time the animal is depleting his source of love and of energy. You know, his, his, his cup is getting emptier as we walk, as he, as he does his rounds. So the ideal is to do this, you know, maybe once a week is a lot already, once a month, twice a month. And then once you've done that is to really get the dog wiped down or another bath and then let them go run somewhere on the beach or in the park or anywhere else just to really shake off all the energy that they have received through being touched so much and to let them recharge their batteries before they go back out. It's really important because, you know, we as humans tend to just kind of take and not be aware of the exchange. There's always an exchange, you know, like uh, Native Americans will always leave a gift to, let's say, they take fruit off a tree. Then you leave tobacco as a thank you. You, you. There's always an exchange of energy. You don't just take one way. You always have an exchange. And I think our friends, the dogs, just love to give and they give very freely. But we have to know that they also need to recharge their batteries and receive in return. And I'm talking about therapy dogs, especially. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm actually going to be training my dog to be a therapy dog eventually. So it's good to know. So that's for good to you to know. It's just, it's a wonderful thing to do. And the dogs also, okay, other point. Often people come to me and so we'll have a consult on this or that. And then they'll ask me, would he like to be a, or she, would he or she like to be a therapy dog? And I ask the dog, would you like to do this work? Some say, no, no way. Don't want to, not my thing. Others go, oh yeah, would love to. So again, you have to find out whether your dog is compatible with your wishes, because some people have real strong feelings about wanting to do good and wanting to help out and contribute to society and to the community, which is all great, but you have to make sure that your dog and you are on the same wavelength. It's such an interesting perspective on just like humans, like when we're in a stressful environment, we need to let release all that energy. And Right. And they, you know, the animals live in a world of energy. They read the energy. They read us very well. We don't read them often well enough, but they read us. Not that they always understand. The same thing if you get on a horse. Let's say you've had a bad day. You've got problems with your, you've had a bad accounting day. Your account is, is, is something's made a mistake. You're having to deal with a bank, blah, blah, blah. You come, you get on your horse and you're all for conkled because of that. The animal doesn't know that the emotions cursing through you are about something else than them or what their immediate surrounding is. They're reading that and they're getting impacted by it. So that's why you have to clear all that out and focus on them. But when we're, you know, going through our daily lives and our daily lives these days are extremely fast and people are a lot on their electronic devices. So we're getting here to a point that I'd like to make is that when we're on the computer or when we are on our phones we are really not there for our animals. It's like we are in a bubble and they're left out. Because when we're on the computer, it's a very mental activity and it's not a place they can go with us. It's not like they can read our, you know, if we're reading a book, sometimes they can kind of zone in and get the feelings that we're going through as we're reading the book. But when we're on a computer, it's a different process. They can't access that. It's kind of, they're not wired for that mental process. And so we're literally not there. So I always go through the example of a lady who brought me her dog and the dog was acting out. So this is a good one for you. So 
first of all, he was not pooping in the yard, refused to go poop in the yard. So she had to go outside and have him poop once they'd done a little walk on the sidewalk, right? Then he would do different other behaviors. And I started to work with the dog. And my conclusion when we were done was the dog was telling me how lonely he was. And so I usually write everything down on it that I'm getting from them. I write it down on a pad of paper and then I read it back to the lady. So I'm reading back, you know, he's feeling lonely. And I thought she was going to fall off the chair in my, in my office. She goes, lonely? I work from my house. I'm there all the time. And I asked her, yes, but are you on the computer? And she was. She had a computer-based business. So she was spending, I don't know, eight to ten hours in front of that computer. And during that whole time, she was also a very focused lady. She was focused on her business or on her computer, and she just wasn't there. So she thought being a warm body and having her dog by her side at her feet was fulfilling her part of being there for her dog during the day. But he was just feeling completely on his own, cut off. Then she was very busy, so she'd open the the screen door and just let him go into the yard hoping he'd pee and poo in the yard, then he'd come back. Well, he'd figured that one out. If he pooped in the yard, then he wouldn't get a walk. So he started to refuse to poop in the yard, and he'd get a walk, even if it was a little one. So I encouraged her to go do a proper walk at least twice a day, which was good for her as well, and to also take, and that I encourage all your listeners too, to if you're working on the computer, which is totally fine, take a break every couple of hours. Take a 10-minute break, a 15-minute break, and be with your animal. Be with your dog. Be with your cat. Have a sandwich. Have a cup of coffee, cup of tea. Just take that break to connect. And then you can go back into that virtual world that they can't access. Yeah, I hadn't considered that perspective when you go into your left brain and then you're kind of out of your heart center and they can't really access that. So that's interesting. You're right on it. As soon as you pop out of that heart center, they are adrift. And that's why, I don't know, there's, um, there's the book, My Stroke of Luck, you know, it's the lady who had, I forget the name, it's by the woman who had, she was a neuroscientist or a brain surgeon, or, and she lost the use of her, she became paralyzed, lost the use of her brain and on that side, and she had to go through quite a lot of therapy and get to get well again. But she was analyzing things from the inside because she knew what was going on with her. And one of the chilling things she mentions is how she could totally sense as soon as a nurse came into her room, whether that nurse was tuned into her and was going to pay attention and be thoughtful, or if it was a person in their left brain who was insensitive and would miss and not care. That is exactly, that was so fascinating to me. And perhaps for the podcast, you can find the name of the book properly and the author. I have it downstairs. It was a very popular book, but that particular part of it, which is also mentioned by the, the man who wrote the, uh, the Butterfly in the Bell Jar, is both people who are totally paralyzed, who cannot talk, who cannot show outwardly what their feelings are, who are totally dependent on what a person will do to be aware of or how a person is going to be aware of their needs without being able to say anything are completely tuned in to a nurse who is heart-based and one who is not. The heart-based one will get it. They won't leave the radio loud somewhere and not know that this person is lying there listening to this program that they don't want to listen and they don't have any way to say, please turn off the radio. They will find a way to ask them, would you like this turned on? Would you like, you know, they, you, I, think, I think he could blink or do something like that where he could say yes or no. And the same thing with this lady who had the stroke. She totally knew that whichever nurse, which the nurse that was heart-based, was, she could relax. She knew that that nurse would notice if something went amiss. That nurse would notice if she was cold, if she needed another blanket, if she was, she would ask her if she was thirsty, whatever. Animals have that exact same problem. They cannot verbalize their needs and they totally sense 
who is going to be aware and who is not. But they're helpless to do anything about it. So my encouragement is to be very aware, to be sensitive. Yeah. And that really explains our um, disconnection with each other in our society being so computer and internet focused that we're not our heart centers are not being um, utilized, engaged, yeah. Engaged. And, and I think, and trust me, I think texting is fun. I love my computer. I have Mac. I've been a Mac person since the start. I've, you know, people used to go, you love your computer. I love my computer. I love all these things. But I'm very aware of what they are. And I'm very aware of when and how I use them. I don't let myself get caught up in it. And I found that these days people are, you get caught up. It's kind of addictive. You get nothing bothers me more when I go on my power walk to see people walking their dogs, texting or talking on the phone. This is the only time of day that this dog, they've been waiting for this walk the whole time. And they want to be with. There's nothing that makes, gives more joy to an animal than to do something with you have you included and have them included so the walk is really important they want you to know they're peeing they want you to know they're pooping they want you to know how excited they are by all the smells and participate in it and they want to participate in your joy of smelling i don't know the breeze and feeling the sun and being outside so when we get closed in to that narrow channel of the phone Again, we're cut off. So the same thing happens as the person that's sitting at the computer with their dog at their feet and the dog can't reach them. Same thing happens on the walk. So do you realize where we're going with this? Parallel universes. And the one that we're in is not that healthy. Because I don't think we need to text while we're walking the dog. Or we can have a conversation. What I really tell people is if something, somebody calls you when you're walking your dog, just say, you know, I'm busy right now. I'll call you in 20 minutes. And give your dog your undivided attention. Stay whole, not fragmented. Because that's what happens when we're on our devices. We get all fragmented. Yeah, and animals are such a great way to raise our vibration. But you make a good point. Like just having the warm body next to us is not going to give us that bump in vibration if we're not interacting with them. No, no. I mean, it's already good that it's there, but it can't be absent-minded. Like often people ask me, well, why is my, uh, my cat reacting? You know, he's bitten me or he scratched me and I was just petting him on my, I was sitting on my chair, just petting him. And then all of a sudden, well, what happened was if I dig a little deeper and ask them what they were doing, they were watching TV or they were talking on the phone or they were absently, they were absent-minded and they were just petting the cat. Now, have you ever been touched by a massage therapist that's doing it in an absent-minded way? It's not pleasant. Or a chiropractor. You really feel that they're not there. They're just kind of going through a motion. And my body, it's happened to me a couple of times, and my body was going like, stop touching me. You're not there. It just becomes a mechanic. You might as well touch you with a piece of wood. It's, it's just absolutely mechanical. And that's what the cat feels. They're just feeling the person petting them without being present. And instead of being pleasant, a a, a really feeling good kind of interaction, it becomes a mechanized, impersonal, empty one. And they really react against it. They know the difference. You need to be present in your hand when you're petting your cat. Your love has to flow through into your hands. One of the greatest, one of the wonderful things I was told early on when I was with my horse, and that was by, an, uh, I, I think it was Samantha Curry, who told me, you know, have love in each brush stroke when you're brushing your horse. The love you have for that horse, that the, the moment, the, the feeling present with that horse extends all the way to the bristles of that brush that you are using. You can do that with everything. You are present in everything. Same thing, the Buddhist, the Buddhist imagery of walking, You know, you walk and they always have pictures of feet. Why? Because the idea is also knowing that you are, when you're putting your foot down, you're putting it down very carefully and you're feeling every part of the step you take. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to ask you, what advice do you have for people who are getting ready to put their pet down or making that decision? Are there any guidelines that you have as to when it is time? 
It's a yes, we do this, you know, I, that's part of my work and it's holding the, the the person's hand and holding the animal's paw. And I would say that the most important element in assisting an animal is timing, finding the right time. So usually I ask them, when are you ready to cross over? Are you ready to cross over? Some of them say no. Some of them say yes. If it's a no, it's often you know, it's they're not quite ready now, but they say no, but I will later. Later can be a week and can be a month, but it's not right now. And it's finding, and then I say, Well, how will you show your person you're ready? For oh, and then I ask them, Would you like to be helped? Would you like somebody to help you cross over? And some of them say yes right away. Yes, I would. Others say, I don't know. Others say I don't. And I explain to people. Let's be ready for everything. So when they usually do want to have help, I explain, I ask them, how will you show your person that you're ready? And some of them say, I won't be able to get up anymore. Usually, you know, they lose the, their ability to stand. Or they say, I won't eat or drink anymore. Or they will say, I will be very listless. I, I'll just be, you know... And so then I explain to people, I say, I'm, I'm always there to help you. So what, at that point, because it becomes very confusing and we're often too close to it to be able to evaluate it correctly, I say, just call me and I will zone in and I will tune in and I will ask them if they're ready or not. And it usually confirms, gives confirmation to the person that, yes, indeed, it's time. Then you have those that say, I want to do it on my own. Well. That's not always easy, and it's not always something that they can manage. However, because in the wild or in normal animal kingdom, those last moments are left for another animal to assist with, right? So normally in the wild or anywhere else, another animal will kill a weaker animal or a dying animal, and the dying animal doesn't really have that much they don't have to make a choice about it it just kind of happens they don't they're not dying a natural death in that sense of the word so when we have domesticated animals and we have so much vet care and we have so much that we can assist them with then you have long drawn out geriatric moments and you have long drawn out sometimes sicknesses at managed care so they're often totally game to do this. They want to stay, they want to be with us, and they will want to get the vet care. You find out when they've had enough and that they're ready to go. Then you have others, and usually they need vet assistance. Those that don't want vet assistance usually want to go through the process on its own. And what people have to understand, that process is not overnight. It's not a 24-hour process. A death process has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning takes so much time, the middle takes so much time, and the end takes so much time. And it take, can, can take a month, it can take six weeks, it can take a while. So some animals want to do that and some don't. Those that do end up being able to cross over. And there's nothing more, uh, you know, usually people have, again, a, a um, they qualify that as, oh, you're more evolved if you can do it on your own, unless that has nothing to do with it. It really is a choice of what that particular animal wants to do and if they feel up to doing it. So those, in my experience, those have said, that they want to do it on their own, I would say most of them have done it on their own. And those who wanted to get assistance were very happy with the assistance. And the way it's done today where people are so loving and so caring about it, it's part of our stewardship, you know, and it's, and it's not anything too traumatic, certainly not for the animal, because at that point they're ready to go. You don't do it prematurely. And you don't do it sometimes an animal is suffering and people are worried about that. And I find out that in spite of the suffering, they're not ready yet. So we honor that. But that is really part of, you know, it's the other side of death is the other side of life. And, and it's part of life. And that's what we, we have to deal with. 
with empathy and compassion and be and be also very down to earth about it. Yeah. So what would you say to skeptics who don't believe in animal communication or maybe telepathic communication? I don't say much because again, you know, I found trying to convince anybody is kind of pointless. You have to have an experience of it yourself. So a person who doesn't ha- hasn't had any intuitive input from an animal, hasn't felt it, just isn't wired that way, hasn't opened themselves up to that, has a really hard time. And I understand that. I mean, if, if you haven't sensed something for yourself, you just have a hard time believing it, right? So what I do, especially with people, sometimes they, they want to, you know, ask me a question that's kind of a trick question, you know, something that only the animal know that I wouldn't know that would prove to them. And I try to stay away from that. And I tell them very clearly, I say, I have to stay in my intuitive side. I don't want to have to worry about whether I'm saying something that's correct or incorrect. I'm getting the information from the animal. It is what it is. And in that information, and usually there's quite a lot of it that I read back to them, I said, you will always find something in there that is going to validate this communication. I don't want to have to do it because that makes me go into my ego of wanting to be right and fearful of being wrong. And then I make mistakes. I have to stay heart centered at all times. And so I let them come to it themselves. And usually they do. And I've had, you know, couples coming here with a, a husband that's been very skeptical or a wife that's very skeptical and is kind of dragged there by the spouse. And I just don't try to convince. I just do what I do. And then they experience it. Something happens in the room or afterwards because I record everything and they can listen to the recording. Something happens and they connect, they get it, they experience it, and then they become your most adamant supporter. So, you know, pushing people into the, something is usually pointless in this type of work. You really have to just do what you do, and hopefully at some point that person will get it because they'll have experienced it. And if they don't, then that's okay. That's what Gnosticism is all about. It's the experience of the higher power, of the higher part of yourself. What the Hindus call the inner sun, S-U-N, sun, the inner light that is bigger than everything. You either experience it and know it, or you have to believe in it, which throws you in your mental world, which is a mental, it's, it's separated from your inner knowing. It's something, it's outside of you. You have to make it become, internalize it to really resonate with it. And same thing with your animals, that to, to get back to most people have this connection with their animals that they resonate with. And that is a conduit to resonating with other things as well. Think about it. They may not be really into in, intuitive or into intuition, but when they sense something with their animal, it is stirring that part of them up. It is awakening it. And through the love of their animal, maybe they'll go further. Yeah. All right. Well, Brigitte, thank you so much for this interview. It was a wonderful conversation and really great perspectives on animals. Before I let you go, I was wondering if I could ask you a few fun questions to get to know a different side of you. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So the first question is like, what kind of student were you in school? Like when you were a child, did you like school? Oh my gosh. I love school, but school didn't love me. (laughs) I love to learn, but I had, again, I'm dyslexic. They didn't know what that was. You know, I'm 64. So in the 50s, when I grew up, I also grew up bilingual, French and English, and that created some problems. But they all thought it was because I was bilingual. You know, they had I was speaking French at home and English in school. It was in England at the time. But in fact, it was dyslexia. So that made it hard. Plus, I was really intuitive and impressionable, and I would feel and sense everything. And I was just... I think walking to a different drummer, but very much trying to conform and be like everybody else. And it didn't quite work out for me because I was always odd man out. And I traveled all over because my father was in the, he was a career 
a career diplomat for this for for Switzerland, and so we were posted in all kinds of different countries, and I had different experiences in different schools. I was in Africa, with in Ghana with Africans, and I was in the Soviet Union. I went to university there with in the Soviet Union in the height of the Cold War, and I was in France with French, and I was in America. I had great education here, um, and from the seventh grade to the twelfth to the grade. And in England with English. And so to top it off, not only did I have a little trouble adapting to my learning abilities, but I also had to deal with a lot of different systems and a lot of different languages. So learning in English, learning in French, learning, oh my goodness. But I was a good student in the sense that I was, you know, I was really trying to get good grades and I loved to learn. But often what I learned I lost interest in it sometimes because it was a little dry. It was I wanted it to be a little more fun. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure lots of kids have that challenge wanting to. Do I, it. Exactly, this, I'm saying that you know. So yeah, so but I did like school. I did. Oh, good. Um, all right, and then secondly, what do you like to do on your day off? Oh, I'm, well, what I've tried to do is incorporate my life so that my days on and my days off have the same vibration, have the same sense of a hundred percentness if you know what I mean so whether I'm working which is wonderful because I love doing consults and working with people or if I'm on my own I stay at the same level of engagement with the day and I'm kind of a, an introverted kind of person that can spend a lot of time alone and be happy. I do like being with people as well, but on a small, you know, it's not a, not big parties. Like I'm more like one-on-one -on -one person or in a small committee kind of person. And so I read, I listen to the radio, I watch TV, certain programs. I love to ride. I have my writing lesson. I walk because I like to stay fit. I eat really well. I've gone to a point where everything is, uh, I'm trying to be in the moment and make everything really worthwhile. And I don't like feeling that time is going by and I'm wasting time. I like to feel engaged even though I'm doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great intention. All right. And to try to carry that and actually make it happen is, um, well, it takes time and it takes focus and it takes intent. But I also have the luxury, I live alone, so I have myself to take care of and my animals, and I don't have a lot of distract, you know, things that are distracting me from that. I understand that people that have a lot of other engagements or have, you know, a five, nine to five job and husband and children, well, it's not as easy to do, for sure. Yeah. And then lastly, what is the number one thing on your bucket list? I don't have a bucket list. Oh, I like that attitude. Yeah, exactly. What goes back to what I just said about every day being special and every day being important and every moment being important. And I don't have a bucket list because if I needed to do something, I'd be doing it. So, and I have done, you know, I've traveled a lot and I've done quite a few things. Um, and there's nothing now that I would want to do before I die because I know that if that need if I if that should ever come up I would do it so I'm not looking specially for that but what I am looking is to live a really rich life every day whether I'm doing something exciting or not yeah well it sounds like you definitely are doing that so fulfilling that intention most of the time yeah <laughs> <laughs> some days can be more difficult than trust me <laughs> All right, Brigitte. Well, well, if listeners want to contact you for a session or um, one of your workshops, I know you said you're taking a hiatus, but what is the best way to find you? You can look at my website, BrigitteNoel.com. You can Google me and Brigitte Noel and San Diego and I'll come up. My phone number is 619-295-5504. That's 619-295-5504. And my website is BrigitteNoel.com. Okay. And do you do remote sessions, like if someone did not live in San Diego? Absolutely. I do phone consults. So I've done, I do phone consults all over, all over the United States. And I also consult in Europe even. So the distance is not, I've done consults in Russia. The distance isn't 
isn't a problem when you're doing telepathy. What people do when we do phone consults is they send me a picture, email me several JPEGs, and I use that as a starting point. Then they are like my cell phone tower when I have them on the phone. I catch them, their frequency. They know where their animal is, and I bounce from, I jump from them to the animal. And then I get the animal's frequency, and we go back and forth. It's an internal process. So a lot of people say, oh, uh, do you want to be on speakerphone? And I go, no, <laughs> I need to be on speakerphone. But I do like having a really good picture, frontal, uh, of that, the animal on their eyes. And it's good. that gives me a starting point. And so we do a phone consult, and they usually last an hour. And I record everything, and I call people back a month later to follow up. To, it's a courtesy phone call to make sure everything is okay. Thank you for listening to Woo Woo for the Skeptic. If you know of someone you would like to see interviewed, I would love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this episode on animal communication, then give your pet an extra hug tonight. And now for your moment of woo. This quote is not attributed to anyone in particular, and it goes, Thousands of years ago, cats were worshipped as gods, and cats have never forgotten this. Have a great week, everyone.